Does not matter. Love, love is love is love. Hate is hate. Anger is anger. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes desire is love and hate and anger all mixed together. And I think we all know that. Um, and the accoutrements and identification kind of begin to slip away. So that was how I entered the horror genre. And, um, you know, and so it made a lot of sense to me when I first started to write horror to be as inclusive as I wanted to be. If people were gay, they were gay. You know, that's the way it was. Um, like, like Michael's story about the, you know, don't make it too gay. Um, one, of my, <laughs> one of my latter professional sales was to a TV show called The Hunger. I don't know whether you guys remember this at all. It was an erotic horror anthology series. It uh, played for two seasons um, on TMN and uh, occasionally shows up at, like late at night on Showcase, you know, because it's got boobies in it. Um, and I, I ended up selling them five short stories, um, three of which were adapted by other people and two of which were adapted by me. And it was a very interesting thing to me that all, almost all of the five that I sold them actually had no sexual content in them whatsoever. They were ones that they picked up and they inserted, quote, quote, a lot of sexual content into them, but they didn't want the ones that had sexual content in, in them for their erotic anthology show, mm -hmm. because most of those were dudes, mm -hmm. doing dudes. The one that they did, um, the one that they did buy, which had a lot of erotic uh, stuff in it to begin with, it was written for an erotic horror anthology to begin with, um, called uh, Demon Sex, as I recall. Um, that was that was lesbian. That was girl on girl, and they ended up taking most of that stuff out because Kathy Moriarty will not kiss a woman on camera. Which really points to the degree to which the marketplace actually dictates uh, what's acceptable and what's not. The interesting thing about terms like queer horror and gay horror and lesbian vampire fiction and all this kind of stuff is that these are not terms that the authors or the editors come up with themselves. Or if they do, it's a marketing tool. Because this, this classification comes from readers. It doesn't come from the writers. The, a writer who sits down to write... And I, 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 there are a couple of my, my writers here, besides Gemma from the Queer Free Books, Dave Nichol and, and Macho Bob Wojcik, the hairy guy that just spoke here. I mean, these are guys who actually sat down, and Bob especially uh, was a little intimidating to address initially about whether he'd be interested in participating in this. But at the end of the day, they were, they were great writers, and they sat down and they wrote some kick-ass stories for this new emerging gay horror genre. And what I found was something that I'd always hoped, which was basically that subject matter is subject matter, and if a writer commits to it, they can write something that's across the board um, engaging, engaging and interesting to people. Y you look, you go to a bookstore, and in, in times past, and this is changing a lot, you would go to look for gay horror, and what little there was, you would find in the anthology section or in the gay and lesbian section, which, you know, I, I'm not averse to gay and lesbian sections in bookstores. I think that this, it's a great uh, filing system. I, I wish they would restrict it to nonfiction because sexuality is a subject. Um, it, it, when you're writing fiction or making art, it, it, becomes, the, it becomes the topic, it becomes the story. And I'm, I was delighted to see Queer Fear and Queer Fear 2 in, in the horror sections uh, you know, across, across the, the, the world um, and, and being read by so many different people and getting some wonderful letters back from, from readers, uh, particularly responding, ironically enough to me, to the stories by uh, straight-identified authors. And I thought, I, I thought it was very interesting when it came to calling together the authors, there was almost a prejudice within the gay literary community to contribute to these books because, oddly enough, not because of the sexual content, but because of prejudice against the genre. Hmm. So if you want this kind of, uh, kind of subgenre, you, you go to the best writers to, to write it. And uh, that it, it, it's fascinating where they come from and the, the, the discussion um, which Gemma and I were having the other day about what qualifies... What, what qualifies someone to write, you know, LGBT horror? It's such an offensive question to me, but it, it is one that's being discussed. There's an award opinion, and in the opinion of many other people, Gemma is in fact the best gay horror writer on the market right now, and she's <laughs> she, and she's married to a to a nice man and has a baby, and she's a mom. And we went to the hair salon yesterday. That's who's writing the stuff that is kicking ass and engaging people's imaginations. Okay, well, you know, uh, laying aside um, completely the question of whether or not I kick ass for imagining myself as a different kind of person in a different kind of situation, um, what I would say is that I, I was thinking about why I found that difficult, why I found it, I, I won't even say offensive, just 
odd and oddly limiting. And the other day I remembered uh, a person who I had completely forgotten, even though he's one of my favorite horror writers of all time, <laughs> a guy named Michael McDowell. Um, he's probably best known these days for having written the script for Beetlejuice. But before that, and indeed after that, he was quietly writing these amazing mid-list um, horror novels. Paperback um, originals. Yeah, paperback originals. Um, particularly uh, a, a book which I personally think should, should be snapped up and republished all over the place called The Elementals, which to me is one of the finest works of horror in the last 20 years. Um, and it wasn't until much later that I found out that he was gay. And um, because reading the books, it's not like that jumped out at you. Yes, there were, there were gay characters here and there. there, were almost, there they were almost kind of stealth gay characters to some degree. Um, people who later you went, that person was gay. Interesting. Hmm. Particularly interesting in the context of, you know, historical uh, horror that he wrote, like things like Gilded Needles, which is about the underworld of uh, 1870s um, New York, um, and has no supernatural things going on at all, but is utterly horrific. And again, seek that out. So un under those um, under those strictures, I wonder whether he'd be able to compete for this either, because here's a gay guy who's writing wonderful fiction, but it's got no gay content in it whatsoever. You know, um, he could certainly apply, but I wonder whether people would support it necessarily mm -hmm. because it is not gay fiction per se. It's not about being gay just because he's gay. This is the difficult question. And my fiction is not straight fiction just because I am straight, no matter what it's about. The whole notion of the gay sensibility, whether or not it actually exists, I think in terms of horror fiction and in terms of genre fiction in general, I think it kind of begins and ends with a sense of otherness and outsidedness. Because mm -hmm. if you start looking for something, it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's like... It's, it's like talking about women's writing and men's writing. It's a very contentious issue because there, there are aspects to writing that people consider very gendered, either very macho writing or very sort of feminine writing. But the, the, the stuff that's considered feminine writing, oddly enough, is usually pretty bad, which is an incredibly sexist concept. And the macho writing, I, I mean, personally for me, it, it, punching and guns and all that, that's, it's not interesting to me as a reader, in a, ne my sexual orientation notwithstanding. So it keeps coming back to the fact that Michael McDowell is such an excellent example because you could say that Michael McDowell, who is a lyrical, poetic, very spooky Southern writer, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful stylist, uh, could have a gay sensibility. But then the question is, are you looking for are you looking for some way to categorize it and and give it like call it a gay sensibility? And what does that mean? And if he wasn't gay and had written the same book, where, where would the gay sensibility have gone? Yes, exactly. Um, so, you know, again, we come back to the idea of identity politics and the idea of it's, you know, Okay, you sh think about black exploitation. Let's think about that. Um, you know, I come out of a film background, a film theory background. Uh, I used to teach um, film studies, basically, and I, I reviewed films for about ten years for I Weekly. So often, I think of things in film terms, in filmic terms. And um, at the beginning of the black exploitation movement, there was an assumption that black people kind of kept to themselves. There was an understanding that, oh shit, you know, Sweet Sweetback's badass song made a lot of money. Wow, we could tap that. That's amazing. But, but particularly within genre film, there was this idea that you, that, 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 that market was not a crossover market. You would not make films that could access both that market and the white market or both that market and the non-black market because there was no point to that. So instead of thinking that maybe we should invite more black people to come see The Exorcist, because goddamn, that's a really good film, the idea was, no, we're going to make a black version of The Exorcist and call it Abby. You know, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Abby. It's not all that great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> they, they, they love us out here. You guys are so lucky to be in here. They all want to be in here. That's what the band Exactly. Yeah. It's a celebration. Anyways, okay. So... But the interesting thing is that although that in itself was kind of segregated, it was another way of saying, you know, we're going to make two movie theaters, like a black theater and a, movie, and a white movie theater, because people like that, even black people like that. What it led towards was a desegregation. It led towards a mainstreaming 
of the understanding that there was a black segment of the audience. And so we moved fairly rapidly within about 15 year period from let's make Blackula and Blackenstein and Blackula has risen from the grave and you know, Dr. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Black, you know, <laughs> let's you know, let's 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 make that. We move from that fairly quickly within a 15 year period with, you know, with occasional, you know, uh, time out for good stuff like Ganja and Hess, which happens to be made by black people for black people. Um, we move towards a mainstreaming of the idea that black people exist in the world. And if you go to a horror movie, you can expect that some of the people on the screen might be black. And some of the people in the audience might be black. And because some people in the audience might be black, they might like to see black people on the screen. The black exploitation phenomenon served another excellent uh, function that probably wasn't intended that is actually applicable to what we're talking about now. Because nobody thought it was important and nobody thought it was relevant except for the segregated market, no one paid a lot of attention. So you got some really terrific performances. William Marshall as Blackula, the scene with the gay interior decorators in, in, in Blackula is actually a really beautifully written and very funny scene. And for the time, he's actually not over the top or offensive. But because nobody was watching, people could actually uh, focus on creating some memorable, memorable characters, and, ha and nobody would care. Yeah. The same thing happened with gay horror fiction or queer, queer horror fiction, because nobody thought that anyone really would want to read a book uh, called Queer Fear or Queer Fear 2. We were able to get stories from authors like um, Douglas Clegg or, or Poppy Bright or Caitlin Kiernan or Gemma. Uh, or, or people like that, stories that actually went on to have a life beyond this, and we were actually able to spend the time cultivating uh, a genre, I guess. Uh, we didn't think of it at the time, but, but it, it has become that, to the point where you can now walk into a bookstore and you can see queer horror by queer horror authors and non-queer queer horror authors uh, on the bookshelves right next to people like Stephen King and Clyde Barker and, um, and Poppy Bright. Yes, and um, so that, that's that's what you hope for. You hope for that mainstreaming. Um, not mainstreaming like, hey, let's make a lot of money, but mainstreaming like, hey, this exists, it's okay, it's fine, it's just life, it's just part of life. And death, horrible, horrible death. <laughs>